Um, so my name is Heidi. I am the CEO, founder and CEO of Urban Solution Group. And what we do is we build mitigation plans for oil and gas development. And we do it on the social and the technical side. Um, so we'll help operators with collaborating with local governments, with the community. Um, and then we also come in and during the operation, we help with mitigation um, to help minimize impacts to the nearby communities. So um, we have a new type of sound wall that goes around drilling and hydraulic fracturing locations to, um, to help reduce those impacts. So we're here to talk about something today that I know I'm personally very passionate about and it's actually been one of the pillars and foundations of why this conference um, even came into existence. And it's really about the collaboration between local governments and operators in the oil and gas industry. And so um, I think now more than ever we can all agree that this is going to become a very critical thing that we all need to become very good at. Um, so I'm excited to be here today to talk about that um, and have this conversation. So with that, I want to go ahead and introduce Brian Kane right here to my left. Say hi, Brian. <laughs> and Brian serves as the Director of Public Affairs at Extraction Oil and Gas, and I am going to get your college right. Um, and Brian serves as the company's spokesman and directs government relations and outreach. Brian was recently named, named one of the Denver Business Journal's 40 Under 40 uh, Outstanding Leaders in Business. Um, and then Brian has a bachelor's degree from A&M University and uh, with an MBA concentration in finance uh, and general management from Tulane University. So I got that all correct, hopefully. Um, and then this is Christine McKinney. She's the senior attorney of the city of Aurora. Christine's a Colorado native and has four children. You've worked for Aurora for roughly 23 years. So over 25. Over 25. Um, over 25 years, and she provides legal counsel over a broad spectrum, but primarily construction and water. Um, she has a applied math and engineering degree from CU and a law degree from DU. So that is our panel up here. Um, so with that, we're going to go ahead and dive right in. So um, my first question, and, and the way that we want to do this is just have, we have a few questions that we want to go over, but then we really want to open it up to questions for the group and have some of a discussion. Um, so the first one I'll go with is for you, Christine. So um, Aurora is unique in the fact that it is the third largest, um, has the third largest population, I think 374,000, 100,000 roughly. You guys also have the most undeveloped, developable, developable area in the state, I believe, correct? That is correct. So obviously we're going to be talking a little bit about what it's like to work with developers, operators, and then obviously as you have communities and oil and gas coexist. So my question to you is what has your experience been like with developers and operators as you guys try to na navigate just your larger land use and plans for Aurora? Okay. Um, about, <clears throat> oh, I'd say six months ago, um, when it was very apparent to the city um, that we were going to have two large operators come in and do development in the eastern and northern undeveloped area of the city, um, my boss and I came up with an idea to bring the developers and the operators together um, in a meeting and discuss what were the issues that they had um, and then was there any way that the city could facilitate um, both um, entities working together and we started out with um, we had two large meetings we brought in all of the developers that we were aware of and all of the operators that we were aware of in one room um, and started having discussions on what are your concerns. And pretty much what we learned, which was to my surprise, is that the developers had been talking with the operators and that the goal of the developers were to let the operators come in quickly within the next five years, get their um, operations going, um, and then they would be in their, their what pr production mm -hmm. phase, and then they could come in later. So th the biggest thing I heard, and I still hear today, is get them in fast, and so we can come in later, um, which was quite surprising to me. And um, I constantly hear that. 
Um, Aurora is unique from, let's say, Broomfield, um, which is um, the, one of the biggest cities that has done operator agreements and the fact that where the operators are going is undeveloped land. So there is time right now for the entities, the cities, the developers to talk. Um, and that is what the city has been trying to encourage is face-to-face -face communication so this, um, the two entities can work together. So if this works, so this is, can you guys hear me? So, I, I, think, I think I'm good. You're good? I think so. So this is, this is what we would consider an ideal <laughs> operator agreement scenario. Um, and, and when we talk about an operator agreement from, a, from an operator standpoint, you want to have certain things to be able to, um, <clears throat> to, to bring sort of BMPs and other regs into an all-encompassing agreement. The, the value from, I, I, I hope, the community's perspective is that you are getting an extremely robust package of the various aspects of what operators can offer. From an operator standpoint, we have, what, what it enables us to have is the scale to be able to plan uh, and to plan a development. And if we're able to have both scale and the ability to plan, then we're able to bring even more solutions. Um, in our case, one of the things that we're extremely keen on, I know there's some other operators in the room who are as well, is the so-called tankless development, which, which is all sort of closed loop where you have your, your oil, gas, and produced water in, in pipelines. Um, so that, that's, that's sort of exciting to us from a scale and planning perspective. Uh, Aurora's unique. Um, from some of the areas that, um, that I've worked in because of what Christine mentions. It's, it's kind of, it's the final frontier for the greater Denver metropolitan area. Um, there, is, there is an area of Aurora that when you talk to council members, when you talk to office holders, they will tell you their vision for this area. It's spectacular. It, and it, um, you know, we know that this is a city that is going to have you know, these guys are thinking big. They're going to have a spaceport. Um, this is, you know, this is an area that um, just brought the Gaylord Convention Center in, which if you haven't, haven't been to this, this resort yet, it's, it's spectacular. Um, and so as we look at Aurora, as we look at these plans, as we talk with the council members and office holders about their vision, which basically is um, almost like a, a, a tech center mm -hmm. part two, um, what, you know, what we can offer is to go in in a planned way with scale and, and uh, get in, operate safely, and then have these locations producing, spinning off, off tax revenue for the next however many years. I think in particular some of what we're, we're proposing um, uh, just, just as an idea for scale could generate as much as $30 million. Um, to the city of Aurora, uh, and then of course much of that, uh, about 80% of that in the first three to five years of development, obviously on a rolling basis as pads come on. And so what, what that could do, and not to speak for city planners, because I know there are a lot here and I'm not one, um, but, but what we hope that could do is underpin some of this development. Uh, residences, I'm told, cost money, right? And so, especially with the passing of 181 in this new world that we live in, I think that operators more and more have to be very clear when we come to a community, when we come to a municipality or a, um, uh, an unincorporated area, uh, we need to be very clear about what our value proposition is. Uh, we have to compete in a way that, that other businesses do now, and we have to be very clear that this is what we are willing to offer, this is what we can offer, and we want to do this in this time frame, and these are, these are the benefits. And so I think when, when, we, when we look at the timing, when we look at, at what Christine mentioned about this area and, um, and the, the ability to have scale and to do even more in terms of BMPs, uh, I think this is, is a really exciting uh, opportunity, I think, for everyone. That's great. And I think, 
you guys just covered a lot of my questions. Um, <laughs> right? All right. So I'm going to do my best here. To keep this thing going. Um, so are, yeah, we are, we, are we done? Yeah, Kirby, do you want 30 minutes back? I'm just kidding. Let's eat again. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think that's great, and I think even just having the dialogue, especially with this room, a lot of times there's the perception that it's uh, oil and gas is, and it, it sometimes happens, oil and gas is coming to a community, and this is a really great example of if you have the proactive approach, what that collaboration can do and what it can look like. So I know that I'm personally really excited to see how that unfolds, um, and I think that there's a lot more um, conversations being had now that have previously potentially not been had, um, or not even to the fullest extent that, that you guys are going to be able to experience. So I think that will be exciting for us as an industry. Um, I guess maybe one question for you, Brian, is, um, so you've obviously done several operating agreements and comprehensive development plans and things like that. What are some of the things for people that are coming in, in your position after you or even on the other side uh, with local governments, what are some of the things that you learned from the most in some of those areas? And then it kind of alternatively, what are some things that you think that you would recommend as a really great approach and it was a good you know, example of collaboration? Sure. So I'm, I'm pretty upfront about the fact that um, we, learn, we learn a lot every time we do this. Um, I, we learn something every time we sit down and have operator agreement discussions. We, you have to, um, and we have. Uh, one of the, I think one of, the, one of the most important things that I've learned is that every, every sort of jurisdiction has a different philosophy about oil and gas development. And that's, that's a really important thing. I mean, we all sort of know and acknowledge that, but it's a really important thing to get your head around. Um, when you go to one community, they may say, you know what, here we like, we like a small number of wells on more pads in this particular area. Other communities will say, we want as many wells as possible on what, one pad, one area of least disturbance. This is how we want it. <clears throat> some areas will say, you know, go get it. Um, and some will say, we don't want you here altogether. And so I think as we, as, we, as we navigate the landscape and as we, as we start to have those inif initial conversations, one of the most important things that, that, that you can do as an operator off the bat is get your head around what is the culture here as it relates to oil and gas. How do they think about it? And not, not just do they like it or not like it. it there are, there are a, a million shades of that. How specifically do they think about what a great oil and gas development looks like, what a great pad looks like, what, what the concept of scale means to them, and, what, what, and do they understand sort of the value that, that we're trying to, um, that, you know, that, that we're trying to impart. And, and so I think that's, that's as, as a first step, one of the most important things. Um, um, <clears throat> you know, as it relates to collaboration, we've, we've had, um, We've had a number of, of discussions with, uh, with a lot of folks. We have done a few operator agreements. One, uh, most famously, uh, an, ex an incredible amount of collaboration over two years. Um, uh, very, uh, at, at times, difficult, um, talking about the Broomfield development, but, but also one that led to um, what I think we consider kind of a groundbreaking operator agreement, one that has uh, some of the best uh, BMPs all in one package that can be found anywhere. We had um, a third party group called IES Trustwell uh, rate that facility design. They actually said this is, uh, this is the highest rated design we've ever looked at in the United States, which for an operator like extraction oil and gas, we're, um, you know, we're, we're six years into this. We, I think we were officially started, I guess, in 2012, but at the end of 2012, um, when I began consulting for our company, there were nine people there. Um, now, I think we have 300 full-time employees, and, and we're probably at around 500 with contractors. And so um, <clears throat> a big part of our story, a big part of our, our growth has been the willingness to collaborate and, and has been some of those BMPs that, that we've been able to, to bring to the base in order to innovate. And when you said that, I kind of think about in terms of what we do in mitigation planning, and we always say that we don't believe in manufactured mitigation. Every location and community is different. And I think that's something that is so critical. And, you know, I have quite a bit of firsthand experience of going into a community and what 
what one community wants versus what the other wants is completely different. It's so important. And their view of success and what is social compatibility and what's important to them is very different. So I think that as we hear things about uh, Broomfield or Aurora or other areas, it's important to look at those tools and techniques and learn um, learn all that's available out there in terms of the technology and how you can do it. But if you're not having the conversations to find out what's important, you could come to the table and basically say, here's this great thing. And they're like, we don't care about that. Right. And, and you're like, we put our best foot forward. Um, and it can be something as simple as just what is important to you. So that's something that we really work with um, with our clients about is just really helping understand the community and the people that you're with. Um, so I think that's a great point. Um, so Christine, what on, on your side, so you've obviously had quite a bit of experience with this, what on your side are things that you found to be very helpful that you would recommend and then what are potentially some of the lessons learned um, that you would do differently and the stuff that, you know, what were the real challenges and how did you overcome those coming to learn a new kind of fairly technical industry? There's an awful lot that I learned, but one of the first things I want to recognize is um, thank, thanking Kirby for doing this conference. I've been to this conference for three years and I, I learned an awful lot. It has helped me uh, with respect to how to negotiate these operator agreements. I know I call Kirby at least once a year with a question of can you connect me with somebody or do you know the answer to this? So I think this conference is extremely valuable and I, I would like to comment on something that our first speaker mentioned yesterday and he used the phrase, I believe it was devilish communications that local entities um, need to engage in with the operators. We have for almost six months, and I'll, I'll use the phrase, joined at the hip. Um, we meet usually two days a week, um, and I bring in different departments. And the one thing that the operator agreement has allowed the local entity to be involved with, with the operators is what I call face-to-face -face communication. I don't think the face-to-face -face communication would have happened if we would be permitting um, through just our local code. But because we did an operator, we are doing an operator agreement, I've had to bring in the planning department, the water department, the fire department, the parks department, the public works department, um, the building department, in face-to-face -face communications. What does that mean with respect to the operators? They had to learn our business. Um, the, the one thing that I see happening in these communications, usually when we start the meeting, we are so far apart, and I just go, oh my gosh, how am I gonna get these agreements done? And the parties work together, and, and what is so valuable um, is the exchange of planning information. Constantly, we are exchanging maps. Where are water facilities? Where are their pipes going? Where are their flow lines going? You know, where does the operator want to be? Where do, where do we want to have our water facilities? Where do we want to have our streets? That communication can happen now because the development isn't there yet. And we are sharing our five-year plans. They are sharing their five-year plans. We are telling them, please, don't go near this, this area. We want to protect this area. So these face-to-face -face communications, and although they're long, intense, I can't tell you how many times I've been there until 7 o'clock at night. Um, it's exhausting. It's tiring. But they're happening. And um, they know our people. We know their people. And like I said, we're exchanging planning information, which is so critical. Um, and then one of the most valuable things I have found, this is the most complex business I have ever dealt with. I've done construction on large water projects. Um, and this industry is so complex. There's so many different phases that I highly recommend that whatever operator you are dealing with 
you go see their sites, you go see the three phases, you go see um, their operations. Um, had I not done site visits, I think I would have been a little bit lost doing these operator agreements. I'll tell you, that's one of the first things that we, you know, we as employees get our, our own people. Uh, if they're not from the industry or familiar with it, that's exactly uh, what, what we do. It's the best way to get people up to speed the quickest. If, if you haven't been out to a site, um, we absolutely encourage you to do so. That's, that's the way to learn the business. Um, but that was such an important insight about, um, about the face-to-face -face meetings and working with each other. And, um, you know, even after the, the operations phase into production, you always have those relationships. And such a big part of, of any really, I think any successful business relationship is communication. And, and knowing who to call with that question, having that relationship, and, and it all came out of those face-to-face -face meetings. That's, that's, I think, really insightful. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with staff where one person will think um, the operators are doing something like their pipes are going a certain way or and I'll sit there and say no nope, no nope, that's not what they told us and we're able to call the designer of the operator and confirm that and get people straight when Mm -hmm. the, the massive amount of people I have to deal with within this city is just horrific. Um, <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. And, and what's very, these, these are difficult negotiations because sometimes you have people with very personal opinions about this business and about the way things sh should be. And to get them in a negotiation phase is difficult. I have to remind everybody and I have to send out emails. This is negotiations. We are going to negotiate. Um, and that's tough. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I did think that yesterday, Jim Cole's presentation was, a, did a lot of people be able to see that yesterday morning? Um, I thought he did a great job talking about um, just the overview of Senate Bill 181, but also putting the onus on everybody in this room to say it's now up to us to determine and have these negotiations about what is reasonable. Mm -hmm. And that's going to take people coming to the table and really having, you know, diving into things in just a different way that we have um, kind of in the future. And so um, in one second, I'm going to ask kind of what you think the backdrop, Brian, looks like potentially under Senate bill a little bit and, mm -hmm. and what you guys are doing to kind of plan for. Um, and then what you've already been doing, doing that already falls within what's being required um, now. But one thing I will say about the training and, and learning, um, so I didn't even know, I, I worked for an operator for a while before I started Urban, but I didn't even know what a drilling rig was seven years ago. And now I own an oil field service company. And just going out there and spending time and learning the operation, it's just so valuable. Um, and I think that it's valuable on either side. I mean, we got a call from Extraction asking us to come and meet to teach 12 of their internal people about sound walls and engineering. And they were going over not just walls, it was storm, you know, storm water containment, it was mm -hmm. dust mitigation. And that was just with their, their permitting team because they were like, it's so important that you guys understand what you're doing, what it looks like in the field. So I think that's a great example of just how you were referencing, Christine, how helpful it is for local governments to continue that education. Um, operators are doing it as well. They're making sure that people understand and the people that work for them understand what they put into permits and what we put into these agreements. They have, they, they have to come into execution and what does that look like? Um, so I think that that's a great point that, that you guys um, do pretty well as a company and obviously that's one thing that we had talked about that I think really helped you kind of succeed. Um, well, I, ironically, I think we were, you know, Extraction Oil Gas was one of the early adopters of sound walls in the DJ Basin. I think we were one of the first to start putting them up, um, whatever it was, five, six years ago. And, and now Heidi's teaching us about them. So. <laughs> and I was like, what's a sound wall a while ago? <laughs> so yeah, five, six years ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so with that, I guess what I'll do so we can make sure that we have enough time for questions is um, what do you guys think is going to be kind of your primary um, focus as we try to 
go into these developments and go into these negotiations, and especially as it relates to Senate Bill 181, um, it, it sounds like a lot of the things that are in there you guys are doing already. Um, what is your guys' take on that um, in areas for, for development and then what you guys think you already are actually probably already doing? You know, while, while we can't speak to specifics of, of any ongoing conversations with any one uh, municipality or jurisdiction, um, I think that it's fair to say there are, uh, there are, there are certain best management practices that we have um, both because of, of, of you know, uh, of, of where we've had acreage and, and, because, and for other reasons, um, our company in particular has, has in the past um, either adopted, tried to adopt early, or, or even innovated in some cases. Um, I think we were one of the first in Colorado to start uh, hooking, you know, hooking rigs up to Highline electricity to power them, uh, so-called electric rigs. They're, 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 they're rigs, they run just like everything else, but instead of running on generators, they're on the grid. Um, the benefit of these, and, and people see tremendous benefit, because they eliminate source emissions, obviously. Um, but they also uh, they eliminate the need for fuel hauling, uh, and and a lot of what we've done, you know, really engineering backward from the issue that that municipalities or communities have, uh, trucks being one of the biggest, um, and that is you know I mentioned I mentioned the the pipelines and the the so-called tankless development earlier, one of the best things about that is it it, it eliminates thousands and thousands of miles of of truck trips. Uh, from the roads because you're not you're not oil hauling. You've got oil in pipe. You've got produced water in pipe. Um, it's also a closed loop. You're engineering out connections so that. Um, and, and let's face it, the the air rules here are are getting tougher. They're probably going to continue to. And so to have those closed loop developments, I think is going to be key going into into this new environment and this new world that we live in. Um, one of the things that I think was really critical to us, in, in as even as SB 181 was being negotiated, um, a lot of communities, um, I, I think, kind of said, "Well, you know, maybe we need to put the brakes on 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 this or that." Uh, from our perspective, and, and the way that we kept engaging during that time, and and especially now, is by saying, "Look, we are going to roll out." basically the best technology and management practices that we know. We're, we're going to roll out the best there is. Whatever gets legislated, I, I'm pretty sure they can't legislate better than the best. Um, and so that's, that's what, you know, for the front range in particular um, and, and within municipalities in the front range, we see that as, as something that is, that is frankly going to be necessary in the, in the new world, and, and that's how we were able to keep going even through these periods of uncertainty. I think we, um, when we first started this process, um, Senate Bill 181 did not exist. It wasn't, yeah. <laughs> it, it wasn't around. Right. And then like three quarters of the way through, bingo, it, it happened, and thank goodness, um, I think we have about 50, without getting into the details, about 50 BMPs um, in our operator agreements. And um, in looking at the slides that were presented yesterday and all the conversations yesterday regarding Senate Bill 181, I'm knock on wood hoping that um, we have addressed most of those issues and we can continue on the, the time schedule that we would like to finish up these operator agreements, but um, it, it was quite a ride um, as that bell was going through and with the amendments trying to keep up with it and as far as negotiating an operator agreement, but I, I think Aurora did a good job in trying to stay on top of the issues. So um, hopefully we have addressed the Senate Bill 181 issues with respect to local governments. Perfect. So with that, let's go ahead and let's open it up to questions. Um, anybody? In your description of the negotiations through in Aurora, it strikes me as planning for a community that's happening five years out, ten years out. Okay. 
In your description of the negotiations between Aurora and Extraction, you talked about planning for a community that might happen five or ten years out, way out on the eastern plains. I'm guessing there weren't too many neighbors nearby? No, there weren't. Okay. Yes. The uh, residential that's why, is, is that's not seemed, there. That's that seemed to like be it. what was missing from the discussion is how do we deal with situations where uh, operations are coming in literally 500 feet away from existing neighborhoods? And how can you help us address those kinds of situations? So that's why I would characterize this as really the ideal operator agreement as I did off the bat. I, I think that being in a situation where you're able to go in and help the municipality plan, uh, it, it doesn't get any better than that. Um, with regard to uh, you know, operations that are closer in to communities, to neighborhoods, um, from my perspective, I think that, <clears throat> and, and I've had some experience with that as well, um, I think that the biggest part of that obviously is, is sitting down and having that face-to-face -face collaboration that Christine described. But I also think that a lot of these best management practices that are being brought to bear more and more by operators and, and used more frequently in the front range now are really the way that, that those types of situations are going to be addressed in the future, where you're minimizing impacts, where you're getting trucks off the road, where you're ensuring uh, the best air quality uh, possible, where, um, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you quite frankly, in our, in our Broomfield development, because there were old verticals scattered throughout the neighborhoods that were drilled in the 90s, um, 80s, some of them. Our development there, because of the technologies that we're using, the closed loop nature, um, by our calculations, will actually improve the air. It will result in a 65% net reduction in emissions by getting those older legacy wells out of those, those neighborhoods that homes have popped up around and redeveloping that area with new technology. Guys, we can, just, we can do it better now. That's the reality. Um, than they could do in the 90s. And so redeveloping those areas is, is uh, I think, uh, we talked about the value proposition is a tremendous part of that value. I, I think to address your question real specifically with respect to Aurora, um, in our very lengthy negotiations, what has been extremely beneficial is um, through the GIS systems, we've been able to overlay uh, neighborhood maps that we have received, they're not very detailed, but at least we can overlay the, the uh, pad sites on top of the information that we have so far so we can take a look at it from a planning uh, viewpoint and look at, okay, where are these pad sites? What would be the best management practices in certain areas if there's planned neighborhoods, even though they don't exist? Um, so that's why I say the face-to-face -face communication has been extremely beneficial because this exchange of planning information is happening. Thank you for that question. And one thing, um, so we obviously work in areas where there are people um, and uh, help with kind of, okay, if we don't have the luxury of the pre-planning or the pro, you know, the extremely proactive and development approach that Aurora is able to take, um, and because not everyone's going to have that luxury, right? Probably few, fewer than more, fewer than most, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, you're, you're not going to have that. However, what I would go back to again is about learning and really spending time with operators to learn what those tools and technologies are to mitigate um, because they, it, it really does exist. There are ways that you can have socially compatible oil and gas development in these urban areas. And one thing that I think is so incredible about this industry is their ability to continue to innovate when you look at what we do in just general with drilling you know, miles long, <laughs> long laterals. Um, it's really remarkable, and so I just think that um, I've had the privilege of meeting just some of the most creative, innovative minds, and I feel like you have a lot of people now that realize this is a huge deal, and there's a lot of intellectual horsepower going into what can we do, how do we build it, and how can we make it better. And there's constantly new products coming out, and operators aren't 
there, it's not hard for them to pick up those products. They want those solutions. So I think, again, having the conversations and understanding what those impacts are, I think having difficult conversations with developers of, okay, you guys want to get the most out of your, you know, your surface. What does that look like? And what do you guys want to do for how we also mitigate long term for those facilities? That's not just on the operator, that's also on the developer. So I think having those conversations are also really critical because um, it's not a surprise. It's not a surprise that, that, that those are going to come up. Um, so I just would encourage, again, the continued face-to-face. -face. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, we're, we're still on question one, but it was a, it was a great question. You know, I, I, think that, um, I think that operators, well, I think everyone in the room right now is trying to, trying to think about what does our process look like going forward in this, in this kind of new world? What does that look forward? And, and, or what does that look like? And from our perspective, if we think about, um, you know, our developments now are being cited as, as really any other that, that communities have land use authority over. And, and if we think about going into a community and drawing a box on a map and saying, this is the area from which our, our minerals can be, can be developed in a way that's, that's economically possible and technically feasible, right? Um, where inside this box should we talk about? What, what makes sense inside this box? And I'll, I'll tell you quite frankly, and this may be an, an unpopular opinion, but um, one, of the, one of the biggest hindr hindrances to, to that sort of siting process that we're all going to, to be working within is, is going to be kind of the, the, the blanket setback at a community level. And the reason is because as we look at in, these, in this new world, as I call it, as we look at this, this box or this area within which we're working, you want to have as much flexibility as possible. And I've had an experience where in working with, you know, in, in working with folks who say, well, we, you know, we have in mind this, this sort of unofficial setback that we like to stick to, and instead of being 800 feet from an intermittently occupied, you know, sort of barn, you go 1,000 feet from a neighborhood because of your setback, right? So as we look at, as we look at bes truly bespoke solutions, which is what 181 is doing, as we plan these developments and we look at basically custom tailored to the community oil and gas developments, you want to maintain as much flexibility as you can to have siting in the best place uh, for, your, for your constituents. That's a great point. I, I want to get to at least another question. Okay. So are the midstream people in the room with you? Because when you're looking at comprehensive land use development, those pipelines also have a significant impact on what happens. So are they part of the dialogue? Uh, yes, they are. Great question. And I, I want to say that that's what makes this so complex that this is such a, a very, very, very complex uh, industry to deal with. And I'm very fortunate that within the city of Aurora, we have engineers in our various departments. So my team consists of a lot of engineers, city engineers coming in and having dialogue with the engineers from the operators. So it's at a very, very high technical engineering level. Good morning. Thanks for uh, the talk today. I'm Mark Morton, local government liaison with the Oil and Gas Commission. Thanks uh, for the email yesterday, Christine. I had a question. I always um, call Mark. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Uh, hey, what is the status of the uh, oil, Aurora Oil and Gas Advisory Committee? Is that still meeting monthly? Is it an open meeting still? Yes. And we have two uh, represent. One, one other quick question. We can have two briefly, representatives here, Brad brief, Pierce and yeah. Polly. Can you briefly describe Aurora's local permitting process and the public component, given that there's going to be a lot more uh, weight to that, well, additional weight to that in the ongoing SB 181 world? Your microphone cut out a little bit there. Can you just give the second part? portion of it <laughs> on the local permitting process for Aurora uh, is there a public involvement component 
similar to uh, the COGCC uh, location permitting and well permitting where folks can uh, submit comments on those. And uh, does Aurora have that as part of their local permitting process or maybe planning for such? I, I, I'm going to tweak it a little bit to what we're doing with respect to the operator agreements because I believe the two largest operators uh, are wanting to pursue operator agreements um, for their oil and gas development. And within the um, operator agreements, there is um, permitting process that allows for public comment, I believe, at least twice. And then I know extraction is doing uh, an open house um, and they've sent out invites. So there's almost, I would say, three events where the public can come in. I believe we're going to try and, and put these agreements on the web page for public comment. So that has been um, probably one of the strongest issues that we are hearing from the operator is that they want to, yeah. want to allow for this process for public comment. Yeah, I, I think that you have to have you have to have that public comment to have a legitimate agreement. Um, and there are also, in addition to what Christine described, a number of additional notifications and communication events on a per pad basis. Um, yes. And so, um, you know, I, it is it is very clearly something that um, you know folks will uh, folks will ding you as the operator or you as the, the community if if you're not um, if you're not prepared to have that transparency and some pretty robust communication throughout the, uh, throughout the process. Great point. Any other questions? Heidi, <laughs> you talked about the ability to um, drill mile-long laterals. In that context, how do you answer the question from residents that say, why does this rig need to be 500 feet away from my house? That's a great question, a great point. And Brian, I'm sure you have sure. Ha have some stuff on this. But um, I would say even though you can do that, the amount of, even though you can drill mile laterals, the amount of um, acreage that you're trying to get is, is substantially large. It goes much more than several miles. So that in itself, the unit of measurement for how much you have to get to, even though it's several miles, which is remarkable, still can't, you can't get it all just from one. Um, it was interesting when I, I did work for an operator, we did an exercise and um, at the time I was on a sta stakeholder relations team and my entire job was working with interfacing with the community and our operations. And I remember going to a surface land man and saying like, you know, how, how come this is here? Why? And I'm, I'm like, you know, you could have moved it anywhere. And he's like, all right, let's do this exercise. And so we actually put together something that was okay, let's, let's all get in a room like this from our company, and here's all the factors that you have to account for in terms of environmental and regulatory and all these things. And when you start to do those, it was, it was, a, it was an area that showed a very clear open space. And you were like, that's where, obviously that's where it's got to go. But because of different environmental concerns and things like that and different regulations, it couldn't go there. So, so having sat in the situation of after I yelled at a coworker and was like, well, why did you put this here? It's a terrible idea. Then I kind of had to put my foot in my mouth. I'm like, wow, that is a lot of things that you have to consider when you put these. Um, so I think that industry is continuing to get better to innovate, and I think that we will do that. But I, I no means think, by no means think that the um, surface land challenges are, are going to go away completely. Yeah, no, Heidi, Heidi nailed it. Um, it's, it's, I think the, a lot of people in this room know it is an incredibly complex process. You know, the number one thing that we always want to do is um, with the new horizontal technology you mentioned, being able to drill a mile or two miles or even getting up into three miles now, um, you still want to minimize surface impact wherever you can, right? So you don't want to have, you don't want to have 10 locations where you can have one. 
And sometimes if you had four or five locations, then you do have more flexibility. If you have one, if you want to absolutely minimize that footprint, then you have less room to maneuver because of the ways that you're going to be drilling laterally. Um, so it is, it's, it's an incredibly complex thing, trying to plan that, trying to plan to, to drain the reservoir um, and get those, those mineral properties that, that the mineral owners have that you've leased, um, that you've made a commitment to develop. Um, while still minimizing that surface area, while still providing for midstream takeaway, can we get pipelines out of there? Can we get trucks into there? Um, does this line up with the city's code, uh, this location? Is this part of their, their planning uh, for, do they want a King Super here someday? Um, what else do we need to look at? What goes into this puzzle? Oh, and by the way, can we, get it, can we even get a surface use agreement here? Um, can we even get this, this, this piece of land from the landowner? Um, so it's, someone should create an app. It would be a great game. Um, <laughs> development location siting. Uh, <laughs> the new monopoly. Yeah, because yeah, there's, there's so much that goes into it, so many pieces of this, of this package. And, and sometimes it comes off, and it is awesome. Uh, and sometimes it, it comes off, and, and, and you, know, you wish that it could have gone better. Um, but I think that, you know, I think that people need to understand that we are always incentivized as operators. And, and I can't speak for communities, but I imagine. But as operators, we are always incentivized to minimize, um, you know, to minimize impacts to the community, to neighbors. We are naturally incentivized to do that. We have no desire to, to put something in a place that, that, that people don't want it. That's a great point, and I think we're we're getting to the end of our time. But oh, all right, I've got. Good morning. Thank you for taking my question. My name is Tony Berflute. I'm the LGD for Delta County. Uh, this is a very quick question. Are you posting and making your uh, BMPs available to the public? When when we have completed them, the operator agreements will be public information. So with that, I guess one thing that I would kind of say to this room, and I think Brian, Brian, well, we, Brian and Christine both hit on it, but just in this last point, um, and Jim talked about it yesterday, was just, I think, understanding also the intent on both sides. I mean, we are tasked with a very difficult thing now, um, and everybody in this room has a job and we have a role to play. And so I just would encourage us all to, um, just like Jim said yesterday, with the communication and, and working on coming to the table, working reasonably um, and doing the best that we can for the situations that we're in, whether we have the luxury of, you know, very, very proactive development planning or the element of the fact that we have to figure out now how we coexist. Um, you know, I would challenge people to really look at when you're potentially looking at somebody across the table, um, you know, we have to work on rebuilding some of this trust that, that Jim was talking about yesterday. And I truly believe that is going to start with the people in this room. And the time is now. We don't have any more time to not figure it out. So um, with that, we'll go, from, we'll go from there. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you.